Montana available to come up and do their presentation. Wonderful. My name is Jody Bikini. I'm a maintenance reviewer project specialist for Department of Transportation. Um, I started out over 15 years ago as the bituminous pavement engineer and so how to extend the life of plant mix was really my goal and then putting that into a form so that it would be electronically available because everything was in a drawer. You'd have to look it up, you'd have to figure out what worked best, what worked worse, so if we could get it in electronic form, it would be easily available. We moved out of states, do, our state doing the mixed design and into a contracted mixed design. And then about four or five years ago, I moved into our maintenance department. And that is really when I saw pavement preservation Mixed designs and plant mix was great, but really the struggle was how do you keep these roads in shape over the years. So if you want the funding, that's all available through our planning, um, how we do the funding, what our uh, lane miles are, all of that. I'm just going to go through the basics of um, what type of treatments we do, what our QAQC is, and then what our trainings are. For our preservation, we do crack seals. Um, they go about every three to five years. We have just recently moved into mastics. I don't have a life expectancy on it because we don't know what the life expectancy is. Um, they've had it down in Minnesota, I think, testing it for 15 years and it's still working. After about three years, it needs some kind of a crack fill because um, a small fracture will go through the mastic and we'll go ahead and fill it. But this is a game changer for us. Um, we have in the eastern part of the states a lot of deflective cracking and this fixes it and this can fix it instantaneously if we have say a, a pavement that's going to go over the top of it we don't have to worry about the humping that we get with the crack seal um, so if for some reason you get the funding or construction is ready to do some pavement and we have these deflective cracks we can go in on the maintenance side fill them up and then they can go pave and not have any issues. We're just starting to look at some of, and we've did this in the past every once in a great while, but we have some um, three-eighths mixes that construction has done in urban areas that are starting to show some raveling. And for maintenance, how do we fix it? We've gone in and micro-milled and then done a chip seal over the top of it, and that seems to be working great. So we will have some areas where we have some raveling that we will be looking at using micro milling as a solution and keep the good pavement we have below, take off that surface issue, and then put down some type of a chip seal. Um, our chip seals are usually lasting about seven to 10 years. On the chip seal side, construction does a warranty-based chip seal, maintenance does not. And the issues that maintenance has with the construction warranty-based chip seals is the warranty-based chip seals on construction only go until you hit the beginning of the winter season, so early December. So it's great if it gets put down in June, July, but what's gonna happen when the plows hit it? We don't know. So it's been an issue between, and kind of a fight between maintenance doesn't like the warranty base, construction loves the warranty base, um, but now with some of the advances in the emulsions, we don't have a lot of the issues with the plows ripping up those chips. So um, we used to do CRS-2P as the emulsion for our chip seals. Now we are moving into CHF RS-2P, so it's a high float, and it is really grabbing those chips, holding on to them. We do not have the aggregate loss with the plows that we were seeing some of it in some areas with the CRS-2P. Because maintenance can do small projects and it's state funded, we were able to kind of be the test site for construction. And so we've been doing these uh, high float chip seals for uh, three, four years. And now construction has picked it up and they have started taking off with it. So we're really moving into a high float chip seal rather than just a CRS 2P. And I think it's about $20 a ton more. We've just recently moved into scrub seals in the state of Montana. So right now I have three plus years because that's the oldest scrub seal that we have in the state, but we're hoping to have the life of a chip seal with those scrub seals. And we are seeing that, that it is actually looking just as good, if not better, than our chip seals. We have now four that we've done on the maintenance side, and I think one that we've done on the construction side in an urban area. Fog seals, when I started, 
with the department doing the mixed designs, that was just a standard thing we would do in certain um, districts in the state of Montana. They would always put a fog seal down. Well, then there were some issues with skid resistance and the state went away from that for probably a, over a decade. And maintenance has just picked it up over the last three, four years. Uh, we've been having a lot of success with our fog seals. It's cheap insurance to keep those rocks on the road and to seal up that pavement. Note in Montana, when we do a paving job, we chip seal immediately after or within a season. And then now we've started to put the fog seals on, which is just a little additional insurance. It's changed the game on how fog seals are looked at in Montana. Before there was the issue of, are we causing black ice with it in the winter? Well, now on the maintenance side, we use chemical that we pre-treat our roads with. And this actually is beautiful because the sun hits it and it causes those chemicals to go into reaction or to cause the reaction. They go into a solution and basically you don't have the ice sticking to the road. So it's easy for our plows to clean up. So more and more we're moving to the different divisions putting down these fog seals. And construction actually just picked it up this year and they've started to do it. And in turn, the, the general public looks at Montana and says, thanks for these brand new beautiful roads that you gave us. We don't <coughs> wanna tell them that it's a chip seal with a fog seal on it, but um, it has made a difference in the eyes of the public. They think that we're giving them brand new roads, so. Um, and then on the construction side, they've done microsurfacing. Um, they're more of the experts in the microsurfacing side because they're doing it for longer distances. On the maintenance side, we usually just do patching for those short um, areas where we have rutting. Um, but if we have bigger areas, then we'll turn to construction to look at doing a microsurfacing project. And then, of course, we have our mill and overlays. And on the maintenance side, that's one of the last things we look at because it's the most expensive. So if we can get these roads fixed with other treatments and we don't have to resort to this, that's where we want to go. We want to be preventative maintenance rather than reactive maintenance. And we do have that in some areas, but not in other areas. So we're trying to get those reactive areas into the other category. So I'm gonna go into our quality assurance and I'm gonna look at it not only by the treatments that we do, but the different phases that we have. We have pre-construction. Um, we're trying to build the relationship between pre-construction, construction, maintenance, other agencies to work together, to look at our pavement management recommendations. Pre-construction a lot of times looked at that um, and maintenance not so much. Now we're trying to blend all that together. So everybody's looking at it. We're looking at a corridor and saying, what kind of treatments do we need on this corridor? We have good for say 10 miles and then for 15 miles we have a fair or poor condition and how can we fix those? Can we fix it on a maintenance side? Can we fix it on a construction side? What level does it need? So we're trying to get those groups together of the pre-construction, the construction, the maintenance. Um, and then we hope in the future that we'll be able to blend our uh, PVMS system on the pavement side with maintenance's MMS, EVMS system. So we can look at how much money are we putting into these roads for maintenance. So if we can look at a corridor and there's a substantial amount of maintenance going on to it, why is that and what do we need to do to fix it? And match that up with Mary Gale's program on what they're getting on their pavement management system. So now we're requiring on the maintenance side that they have to look at her annual report, work with construct or work with pre-construction and figure out, okay, what is the plan for each of these divisions on how we're gonna treat these roads? On the construction side for quality assurance and quality control, we have our specifications. Um, we are trying to blend maintenance and specifications, construction specifications, so they're one. So it's not confusing to the contractor. If they go out and do a chip seal and they do it for construction or they do it for maintenance, it's the same. Same with crack filling, um, paving. So you get the input from everybody. You get the input from the maintenance side, you get the input from pre-construction and construction um, and materials. We have quality assurance testing on our construction, um, whether it's a maintenance contract or a construction contract. It gets tested. It's either um, going to be a qualified product or we're gonna do some kind of quality assurance testing. And then of course we have inspection, inspection, inspection. We have inspectors out there to see how the work's going down 
Um, what we've tried to do is do some kind of unity between our maintenance and construction crews. Our construction crews are very informed on how to do chip seals, how to do mastic, how to do crack filling. Where on the construction side, they have the microsurfacing, they have the paving. And so if maintenance has a paving contract, we will utilize construction forces to help us with that paving contract. And vice versa, if construction has, let's say, a, a crack fill and a chip seal, they'll use maintenance forces to help them with it so that we make sure we get a quality product. And that disconnect really caused a lot of problems. You would see a construction project being built and maintenance saying, oh, they're doing a horrible job of that chip seal. We try to put ownership on our maintenance forces to say, why do you drive by that? You're going to have to maintain that for the next 10, 15 years, whenever the funding gets there. So if you can get out of your vehicle and help them and assist them to make that right and to make sure that that contractor is doing the correct process, that's going to save you all those years of maintenance you'll have to do on that road. And that's actually starting to work in a lot of our areas. We're starting to see a better product because we have that joint between construction and maintenance. And then on the maintenance side of the quality assurance, the afterlife, after that construction, um, we evaluate the specifications. Did they work? Do we have areas where they didn't work? How are we going to fix those? Can we fix it with a specification? We also have project review and asset inspection. Um, with our new MMS system on the maintenance side, everything on, on our right of way is an asset. So we can evaluate that roadway. We can see how did that asset perform and then put that in the system. Um, and then of course, if we do have issues, we go into the forensic of it. We deal with geotech, we deal with our labs with um, taking cores and evaluating those cores. We work with non-destructive testing and we see what kind of roadway did we have below, was it an issue? You know, did we not do the right treatment? Um, why did that particular project fail? And then we try not to repeat it. And then we have our yearly maintenance cost evaluation using our MMS, EVMS system. How we now are, are causing the maintenance forces to evaluate what is that cost for maintenance to do the work versus contracting it out. And then we look at it after and say, did we get our bang for our buck? Did, did they stay within the cost that we thought? Was it cheaper? Why was it cheaper? Was it more expensive? So we evaluate those costs on that road and how it performs. And then if we go into the quality assurance for the actual um, payment treatment, on our crack seals, they're accepted on qualified products. Maintenance will randomly test for the projects that the maintenance does. We'll test that product and then that becomes basically a verification for our construction projects that use our crack sealant. Um, Mastic, right now it's accepted on a product data sheet. We are currently working on specifications because it is fairly new. We've been using it, maintenance forces have been using it for four or five years, but now it's just starting to be used on construction projects. So we have to figure out what specs we're gonna use for that. And we're hoping that it'll be similar to our crack seal. So it'll be on a qualified products list. Our mail overlays, that's a visual inspection, just as these other ones are. But first there's a visual inspection, and then we also have our um, QA volumetric testing. On our construction side, it is incentive, disincentive based testing. Um, on the maintenance side, it's just disincentive. So they don't get the incentive. You either do a good job or, or we're gonna take money away. So we test that product, we test the plant mix and it has to meet volumetric testing on the construction side, it has to meet ride specifications. Um, and then of course we always test our bituminous material. Um, micro milling, we do test sections, we have a visual inspection. Chip seals, scrub seals, microsurfacing, of course those are visual inspections. We test the binder and then we test the chips. Um, and then fog seals, we do a visual inspection and we also test the binders or the, bit, or the emulsions. For training on the agency side, the state had an audit on how we were performing as a Department of Transportation. Our state audit came in, looked and evaluated what we were doing and one of the things they caught was we probably need to do some training on our contract administration, at least on the maintenance side. So we put together a program to go out every other year, so we do half the state one year and half the state the other year, 
and we do a contract administration training. So that's what does the maintenance crews look for in a contract, in a construction contract, or a contracted payment treatment? What should they be looking for when this contract is going on? How many samples should they take? What do you look for in a chip seal? They have a checkoff list. What should you look for in crack filling? So we go in depth, and it's usually a day's training on here are the basics that you need to look at. Pre-construction and construction does a conference every year where they try to bring in some type of payment preservation um, training. Uh, we also have WAQTC certif certification on the construction side. We have crack seal, chip seal manuals. Uh, the Asphalt Institute comes in every year and does a, a yearly conference. Industry and agency right after that Asphalt Institute conference, we have an industry agency roundtable where our agency meets with the contractors that perform this work and we discuss the pros and cons that we saw for that year and how can we fix any issues that we have. Um, and then most importantly, on-the-job training is very big. On our maintenance forces, they actually get to do the crack feeling, they get to do the chip sealing. So that helps them become the expert and then that way they can help construction when they have contracted chip seals, crack filling. Oh, and it also teaches them what to look for when a contractor performs this work. So we like to do that cross-training between construction and maintenance. On the industry side, uh, their big push is on-the-job training. And, you know, some, a lot of times we'll have the same contractors doing the same work. So there's so many that are doing crack sealing, and there's so many that are doing chip sealing. And you'll have those contractors that do great at chip sealing, but then the next year, it's not so great. And you find out that they've lost their distributor drivers, they've lost their um, chipper operators, and it's new crews, it's new people, and they haven't trained them that well, or they didn't do the on-the-job on training. And then we start to see issues with that. So on-the-job training is very important, but it has to be passed down and it has to be mentored, whether it's maintenance that's doing it or, con or it's contracted out. Um, on the construction side, on the contractor side, they do ISSA training for their microsurfacing. Um, a lot of times they rely on the supplier or manufacturer to help them with on-site training. Um, and then, of course, they go to the As Asphalt Institute and um, conference, and then we have that industry um, agency roundtable. And with that, do we have any questions? First of all, compliments on uh, getting maintenance and construction together. We've had a little experience with that too, and it's, it's yeah. really helpful. Um, but it, um, on the micro surfacing, mm -hmm. it looked like from your picture that was on I-90 or some. It was on an interstate. Yeah. yeah, okay, on a higher volume facility. Have you seen studded tire wear um, yet and been able to compare that to your studded tire wear rate on asphalt? or? I haven't seen that. It doesn't mean that it's not there and construction's not seeing it. I don't have as much experience on it. I do know that they have had some issues right after a microsurfacing's been put down, and I'm not sure what the issues were, uh, if it was that or if it was, you know, at, at times I've heard that it was a great treatment for that time when it was initially nominated, but the road deteriorated by the time that contract went out, and it was not the right treatment when it actually was applied. It, it had kind of, the, the pavement had gone beyond what was needed for a microsurfacing, so. I guess my question is, you know, you guys do super paved, we do super paved. We tend to see drier mixes. The contractors, you know, we pay on volumetrics, so the contractors, you know, try to save money by, you know, cutting yeah, yeah. ass. What have you been able to see from a maintenance standpoint once the construction's done and, and then you get this pavement that might be a little bit dry and we're seeing a little bit of, it looks like the pavement's uh, older than it really is, and I'm wondering if you know, were, uh, things like the fog seals to maybe put some asphalt in that surface and try to keep the rattling down and things like that. So when I was doing the mixed designs, we had a grade S, but we also had a grade D mixed design, and that had a lot more oil, and natural fines were not allowed in it um, unless we, we performed a volume swell, and so a certain percentage was allowed, but if there were a lot of clays, they had to come out of the mix. Then we moved to the super pave, and it actually did dial down the oil. Um, a lot of times we try to adjust that in our band that we allow for our volumetrics. Um, but from what I've seen on our grade Ds to our grade Ss, do I think it's affected the life? I do think it's affected the life somewhat. 
um, those Euler mixes did perform better. And we've had on the maintenance side some issues where that oil did get turned down and uh, Marias Pass over by Glacier National Park is a perfect example. There was a construction project that was a grade S, a maintenance project. At the time, it was a grade D. The contractor came out, same contractor, same pit, same oil supplier. Construction had testing the whole project. On maintenance, we had the initial testing and then the lab had left and the oil got turned down. And before the chip seal got put on the next year, maintenance was out fixing that road and it has been a nightmare. And so actually about three, two, three years ago, we actually did try to do a fog chip fog to save the road. It might not have been the right treatment, but we didn't have the funds to do the right treatment. It really needed to be milled up and put down again. So it is a nightmare. And that's what we try, why we try to blend construction and maintenance together because those maintenance crews, they walk the road every day and they go into the grocery store and they have to see their neighbors and explain why the road is bad. And so when construction comes out to do a project and they can be there for you know a month or so and then leave, there's not the ownership there. But if we tie them in with our maintenance forces and the maintenance forces are out there working with them and explain the ownership that they have in that road and how significant it is when they have to tell you know their neighbor why the road is failing two three years down you know after it's been put down it starts to have accountability for those inspectors on the construction side so accountability is huge on quality control quality assurance um, and and because the maintenance forces work those roads every day yeah we do see issues when when the pavement the super paves not done right it's our nightmare and it's our nightmare for probably 20 to 30 years till the next budgeting comes up. Yeah, we have had issues with the oil being turned down, um, but we try to fix those with the specs to try to bump up what we allow. Uh, Jim Weston, Washington State DOT. Um, real quick, for your wearing course uh, mixes, are you, what are your general classes that are primary on like your interstate or high volume routes? And I guess if I had a second question, is your main, are your maintenance forces coming in with your chip seals uh, at a specific time after those pavements, or is it uh, just kind of as it as it arises? So in the state of Montana, whether it's um, an interstate, a primary, a secondary, if it's paved, it's chipped within that year. So if they happen to pave June, July, August. They're allowed to chip seal up till August 31st, and then there's a cutoff. And so if they don't get it that year, then they have to do it the next spring. But we chip immediately, within a year of that pavement going down. It was related to uh, what is your general class of mix for your HMAs? Are they like half inch, three eighths, three quarters? So we have um, three quarter inch mixes, we have half inch mixes, and we have three eighths inch mixes. And the three eighths inch mixes are sometimes very fragile. So a lot of times those really need to be paid attention to. On the maintenance side, we've decided that because we don't do a lot of overlays, we're not allowing 3 8 mixes. So we'll move into half inch mixes if we need, you know, something that's a little bit tighter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.